Daniel, what did Michael Jackson's death show you about the need for critical thinking? Well, so it's interesting. We have these uh, ways of uh, authenticating information. Journalists follow certain procedures and protocols, right? Right. And, you know, legitimate professional journalists tend not to run with a story until they're sure that it's true. Uh, the New York Times calls themselves themselves the newspaper of record, right? They don't yeah. want to get it wrong. Now, the fact is, journalism is complicated, and they do get it wrong. They print retractions and corrections every single day. But they didn't run with the story, and CBC didn't run with the story until they could get a second person to confirm the death. In the meantime, TMZ got it right. So the thing, I, I, the way I look at getting your news is you're playing a, a statistics game. You're playing an odds game, and you're gambling. Um, TMZ gets it right once in a while, but they're not as likely to be right as CBC or the New York Times. Right. And so I figure I'll wait. I, I can wait, you know, because I'm, I'm more concerned about getting accurate information, and I'm willing to wait for it. Um, we saw this with the Syrian bombing, um, the weapons, uh, chemical weapons there, that the initial reports that came in were not from professional journalists, and it turns out they were wrong. We were relying on the Twitter sphere and other things. Right, yeah. And as you know, Candy, it took a team of professional journalists to go in, and it took them a couple of days to sort out that the people tweeting had no firsthand knowledge of what was going on. They were relying on an account from an account from a story from a person. I know a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy. Yeah. And so in the Michael Jackson case, yeah, they get it right once in a while, but you know, legitimate news outlets get it right a lot more than that. You know, for listeners who are of all ages, you can think back to if you watch any of the documentaries about when JFK was shot um, and you see Walter Cronkite going through uh, such a huge process of do I go to air with this or not? Is he confirmed dead or not? It's such a long process. Now it's so quick. I, people were all abuzz two days ago here at CBC about is it true? Brangelina, is it over? Did it break up? But it that got out so fast. What is going on in a person's brain when you're trying to decipher through that stuff? Oh, well, there's a complicated series of processes. The part of the human brain that is most advanced for any primate or any species is the prefrontal cortex. Um, and this is the seat of critical thinking. It's also responsible for planning and conscientiousness and impulse control. And we can learn to develop this part of our brain through training and nurturing of parents and educators. And the idea is that um, my assumption here, Candy, is that evidence-based decision-making leads to better outcomes. It leads to greater longevity, better health outcomes, a happier life. You end up not giving your money to somebody who's going to make off with it. Um, you end up making better decisions about who you want to spend your time with or your romantic life with, uh, better purchasing decisions, the whole gamut. Yeah. Evidence-based decision-making takes time. Uh, and as Danny Kahneman and other researchers have shown, if we just go with our gut, we're, we're right some of the time, but we're wrong a lot of the time. And I would liken it again to the difference between... TMZ and CBC, right? right. Got to play the percentages. Your gut's going to be wrong more than it's right. And if you just take your time, let the evidence come in, weigh it objectively, you know, pretend you don't have a, a dog in the race, then make your decision. Then you can rally your emotions to help you get things done. Right. You, you've said that expertise and identifying expertise is one of the pillars of critical thinking. But, you know, how difficult is that in this culture that we're living in when really it's that phone in your pocket that most people are relying on? Well, I think the first step is to realize that when you land on a web page, that's not the end of the research enterprise. That's just the beginning. Ask yourself, who operates this web page? Might there be biases in the account that uh, is, is being presented to me? Um, and there are tools on the web to figure out who operates web pages. Uh, one of them is the link tool in Google. Have you ever tried this? I haven't. Suppose you end up at a web page and you're trying to authenticate it. Type in link colon into your Google search bar, link colon, and then the web address. It'll tell you all the sites that link to it. So if, it, if it's a health or medical site and it turns out Health Canada links to it, go to Health Canada and see if they're linking to it because they say avoid this site 
or because they say, yeah, this is the, this is the dope. Yeah, so often people will quote, uh, oh, this is from the New England Journal of Medicine, but it's not actually, you know, somebody is interpreting what a, a study that has come out. It's not that... Or it's not actually source. from the New England Journal. They yeah, just they said just it was. Yeah, they're just dropping it. Right. Um, there's a couple of obvious examples in your book. You used a Mark Twain quote uh, that's been mentioned in two movies, An Inconvenient Truth and The Big Short. Um, can you give me that quote? Yes, the quote is, it ain't what you know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Oh, that is so true. Talk about that. Well, so I like the quote because I think that it's true that um, when we're overconfident, uh, when we're, we know for sure that something is true, we're not open to the possibility that we might be wrong. And that leads to all kinds of disasters. And we see this in government and in corporations. And So know, say it again, though. When you know something is true, it, it leads to trouble? Is that what you're saying? It's not what you know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that ain't so. It's, it's knowing things, you know, believing things that are false. Okay. But you're so sure of that belief. Right. Um, and so, you know, you're, you're walking through town and you get lost because you were sure you knew which way you were going and you didn't look at the directions, oh, right? Oh, yes. Which... Or, you know, you handled this nuclear power plant meltdown wrong because you were sure that you knew the procedures and you didn't stop to look. So... The, the quote itself is an interesting example of the quote because it appeared in these two movies, yeah. Big Short and Inconvenient yeah. Truth. Mark Twain never said it. Really? The fact checkers for those movies were so sure they knew it was Twain that they didn't bother to look it up. Oh, my goodness. And Twain never said it. So how hard is it to actually source a quote? Well, that, that turns out to be very difficult, and I had to rely on the help of a librarian for that. But I think the lesson here... You know, there's one thing that we Canadians do better than our friends south of the border in terms of critical, th and it's a cornerstone of critical thinking. Um, I think we have more humility in general, as, you know, as a country. Yeah. And so we approach situations with the notion that maybe I don't know everything and I could learn something. Maybe there's an expert out there who could help me. And, you know, Americans dispositionally, uh, and I'm an American also, we tend to be a little bit more sure of ourselves even when it isn't warranted. Canadians aren't know-it-alls, but Canadians love a good story. Whether you're listening to the radio or you're sitting around a table somewhere having a couple of beers, there's always a great storyteller who's going to tell you a story. Um, and sometimes that really will sway a person's opinion because the story was so good. So how real realistic is it to think that people are constantly going to be thinking critically? I've heard a good story. Now I'm going to go and fact check to see if that was real. Well, there is research that shows that if you point out to people that their gut decision-making um, is faulty a lot of the time, and you point out some of the foibles of human reasoning, such as a vivid story often overwhelms us, uh, yeah. and we pay more attention to that than to statistical evidence, people can overcome it. It just takes a little bit of effort, a little bit of self-discipline to realize. I, I'll give you a story about the vivid s story. Ooh, yeah. So... A teacher of mine, Amos Tversky, uh, went to a party and ran into a friend. Uh, this is somebody who's in the decision-making research business. And he says, the friend, how's it going? The friend says, oh, I'm going to buy a new car. Amos says, what kind of car? The friend says, oh, I'm going to buy a Volvo. I did all the research. Tens of thousands of Volvo owners were surveyed. And I compared that to all the other cars, and they've got the highest consumer satisfaction ratings of any car. A couple of weeks later, Amos runs into him. The guy changed his mind. He's not buying a Volvo. Amos says, why? You did all that research. He says, well, my uncle had one, and he told me it was in the shop all the time. So here's <laughs> one data point on the one hand versus tens of thousands on the other, and you go with the story. Yeah, because my uncle for sure would not lie to me. Um, David Blaine... Well, and he might not have been lying. Yeah, but, but it's only one experience yeah. compared to tens of thousands. David Blaine, the celebrity magician, is another person that you write about. Um, tell about his glass box stunt and why you wanted to fact, fact check that. Well, so David Blaine is a magician. So in effect, he admits that he's a professional liar, right? Right, he's, yeah. he's He's doing these tricks and making you think that it's the occult. But, I mean, it's really, he's a trained magician. The interesting case about Blaine, and he's a fantastic magician, is that he also 
has this career as an endurance artist. So the question is, is he really an endurance artist or are those magic tricks too? Right. And in the glass box experiment or the ice room experiment where he spent, you know, an enormous amount of time in a block of ice. Yeah. Um, the question is, did he really do what he said he did or is he lying to us? And I poked at the question by interviewing some experts who were there and some expert magicians. Yeah. And I ended up with a mixed bag of opinions from the experts. Oh, really? And so you have to kind of, and I lay it out in the in the book, and I think it's a case where... You have to decide for yourselves. I, I, I'm not trying to tell the reader what to think, just trying to give them the tools about how to think. I think you're entitled to your own opinions, but you ain't entitled to your own facts. <laughs> Do you ever feel or worry about that you're, you're taking the beauty of the illusion out of things when you fact-checked? Well, no, because I don't want to believe a bunch of things that aren't true. I don't want to crowd my head full of stuff that shouldn't be there. I, I don't know about you, but... I'm at the age where I feel like every time I learn something new, it pushes out something old I used <laughs> yeah. to know, like the time I took that home winemaking course and then forgot how to drive. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The more that goes in now, once once you pass a certain age, for sure you're losing stuff. Daniel, your previous bestsellers have looked at how music affects the brain and how the brain processes music. How different is that to what we're talking about here with critical thinking? Well, I'm, I'm both a musician and a scientist, and in both roles, I think critical thinking is important uh, to achieve your goals in either domain. Uh, when you're writing a song uh, or performing a song, you have to think, is this the best way to do it? Is this lyric any good? Is right. this chord progression going to reach people? And there's a, a lot of inspiration and art behind it, but there's some craft, which is evaluating things. And certainly in order to do the science that I do at McGill to look at the musical brain, uh, there's a lot of sifting through facts and trying to figure out what story the numbers are trying to tell you. And I put it that way because I know you have an interest in stories. And the, I think the average person tends to think of numbers and statistics as facts. Yeah. And they're not. Statistics are just numbers that were collected by humans who have their own biases, their own idiosyncrasies. Sometimes they're competent, sometimes they're not. And so I think it's incumbent on all of us to just take a step back and ask, are these numbers plausible? Are they reasonable? Where do they come from? Especially polls. Who's being asked the question? What que Next time you hear four out of five dentists recommend something, which dentists? Yeah. Were they kicked out of the dental association? <laughs> <laughs> Were they on the dole of, you know, of the, yeah. of the toothpaste company? Yeah, so true. Um, we like to think that we value critical thinking. Um, you know, academics, scientists, journalists certainly say, hey, yeah, this is a thing we value. But do people take most things at face value? And how do you convince them not to? Well, increasingly, we are taking things at face value, I think. Uh, you know, there was a recent report that a lot of people under the age of 25 now get all their news, 100% of their news from Facebook. Yeah. Which is not a news organization. Yeah. Uh, so it's not vetting the content. Um, I think that we've become less critical in the face of information overload. There's just so much out there, we throw up our hands and we say, I, I don't know how to deal with this. And that's why I wrote the book. I think of the book as a guide, a toolkit for the average person to have some concrete steps. These are, the, these are the questions I need to ask. And I'm not talking about questions that take more than 20 or 30 seconds in most cases. Yeah, there's been so many books about, just I noticed in the last decade, books like blowing holes through textbooks. You know, you find that one, uh, The Lies My Teacher Told Me. You've, you start to realize as you get older and, and get more wise that a lot of what you learned in school wasn't reality. What, you know, it was somebody's version of reality but it wasn't necessarily a fact. Yet still, in this day and age, most people are at university and have to opt to take philosophy before they are ever taught about thinking. Why don't we, particularly now, when young people are faced with all of this false news, why aren't we teaching people how to think at a younger age? You're absolutely right. We need to start teaching kids at age 12, I think, uh, how to be info literate, to know what uh, to, to look at when they're at a web page or at a source or a document or just something they hear in the in the ether. Yeah, uh, we need to teach it to everybody because the primary mission of educators has to shift from cramming little heads full of facts 
to teaching them what to do with those facts, uh, how to use them creatively, uh, how to make the world a better place with the facts that they have, uh, rather than um, just, you know, we spend so much time in school, you know, shoving things into people's heads. But as the great Canadian writer Adam Gopnik points out, by the time the teacher has explained the difference between elegy and eulogy, everybody in the class has already Googled it. <laughs> it's so true. They're going to get the facts, but teaching them how to discern truth from uh, falsehood or science from pseudoscience, that's the next big challenge, and then how to use that information creatively. So we, you know, we aren't doing it. We aren't teaching kids at a young age. Uh, people are learning their news all from the internet. I mean, newspapers are dying. What does that say culturally about our values around critical thinking? Well, I, I think I don't think that we don't value critical thinking. I believe we do. Four-year-olds do. You say to a four-year-old, it's bedtime. The four-year-old says, okay, well, so, and then you say, well, because you need to get a good night's sleep. Why? Well, because you want to be rested for school tomorrow. Why? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So we're, we innately have this. Right. right. We get it drummed out of us. Uh, you know, and I think what we've become, as Andy Borowitz, another New Yorker writer, in addition to Adam Gopnik, Borowitz said, warned of a powerful new strain of fact-resistant humans who are threatening the ability of the earth to sustain life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so make your pitch. Why is it important for everyone to be more critical? Two big reasons. One is that um, taking responsibility and being a conscientious evaluator of information, evidence-based information, leads to better outcomes for your own life, your own, you know, the... The bottom line is you'll be happier, you'll make better decisions if you're a critical thinker, if you evaluate information properly. The second reason is that, you know, in this grand experiment of democracy where we're trying to create uh, a political system where people can live together and compromise uh, with one another and be harmonious and have a voice in our government, um, if we're not critical thinkers, we're prey to politicians or um, partisan media who might want to put one over on us and have us vote for somebody who's not going to do things in our best interests. An informed electorate is the best defense against tyranny. Let me ask you this in the, in the short time that we have left. People don't always respond to, this is better for my health, it's going to be better for our neighbors, it's going to be better for our community. But sadly, in the world we live in, people are driven by money. If people were more critical in their thinking, could all of these Ponzi schemes that have come to light in the last few years have happened? Well, that's a tall order um, because with the Ponzi schemes, you've got people who cloak their dialogue in the language of science and research. And, you know, it can be hard for the average person to penetrate all the layers. I, I feel bad for the people who were taken advantage of by the great Ponzi scheme purveyors, yeah. but I don't blame them. Uh, it's not like the, you know, some of the telephone scams where someone gets you to give your social insurance number over right, the phone. Right, your bank or, account. Right. That, that, that uh, critical thinking can get over. But, so, you know, it, there's an arms race between the lying weasels and the rest of us where they get cleverer and cleverer and then we have to get cleverer and then they come up with new things. Great. Thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure, Candy.